Hello and welcome back to Joining the Dots. My name is Thomas and this session will be focused on the doctrine of the Trinity, one of the more complicated matters of Christian theology. As Christians, we believe in one God, but who is also somehow three, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And this doctrine has been an important marker of Christian orthodoxy for many centuries. Now, this is obviously a too big a topic to fully cover in one video, but hopefully this will help to provide a useful starting point. So skeptics of the Trinity might ask, if this doctrine is so important, then why doesn't the word appear in the Bible? Well, let's start by defining terms. Trinity is just a Latin word, which means threeness. When we talk about the Trinity, we are simply talking about the mysterious threeness of God. So it's worth pointing out at the start that the root of this doctrine is not in some sort of abstract theology, but in the real world experience of how God has chosen to reveal himself to us through the Bible. We see this threeness all the way through the New Testament. At the end of Matthew's gospel, when Jesus is sending his disciples out into the world, he commands them to go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Three identities there, and yet sharing a single name. And we have this idea of threeness then right there in the teaching of Jesus himself. The New Testament clearly teaches that Jesus is God. He says in John's Gospel, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. And yet we also see him praying to the Father. He doesn't say, I am the Father, but he says, I am in the Father and the Father is in me. Quite mysterious sort of language. And then we have the further complication of the, the Holy Spirit, the third member who is also God and yet in some way distinct from both Jesus and the Father. The Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you of all that I have said to you. So this is the basic raw data that we are given to start to build up a picture of the Trinity or threeness of God. So let's try to break down this doctrine of the triune, the three and one God, a bit more. We could sum it up as the logical conclusion of six simple premises, which can each be independently supported. Firstly, the Father is God, the Son is God, and the Holy Spirit is God. And yet, the Father is distinct from the Son, the Son is distinct from the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is distinct from the Father. And these six statements, supported by the New Testament, form the basis for what we call the Trinity. The Church then came together in a series of early councils in the 4th century to further articulate and codify this doctrine in the Nicene and later the Athanasian Creed, which you can find in the Book of Common Prayer. The creeds talk about God as three persons who are nevertheless one in substance or essence. And these precise definitions are useful for clarifying what we mean, and just as importantly, what we don't mean when we talk about the Trinity. Although, of course, even these terms are based on analogy with things familiar to our experience, and they cannot fully encompass the nature of God. But the creeds give us a solid foundation to build on, because the theological work has already been done for us. We're not left as individual Christians to try and construct a theology from scratch. Jesus promised that the Holy Spirit would guide the church into all truth. And so we can have confidence in the apostolic teaching that has passed down to us from the earliest times. We don't need to be academic theologians to be disciples of Jesus. Thank goodness. The first disciples constantly misunderstood Jesus' teaching while he was living with them every day. If the success of the church depended on their natural ability and understanding, we certainly wouldn't be here 2,000 years later. So I began with the New Testament and the teaching of Jesus, because that's where the threeness of God is seen most clearly. But what about the Old Testament? 
there's certainly a lot of emphasis here on the unity of God. And Jews and Muslims today who only accept the Old Testament deny the doctrine of the Trinity. So is the Trinity incompatible with the Old Testament? Well, it's true that we don't see the threeness of God being clearly stated here, but there are still many hints of a mysterious plurality within God's nature. And I've picked a few examples to briefly skim over, coming from the different categories of Old Testament writings. We can start at the very beginning with the creation story in Genesis. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the face of the deep, while the spirit of God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And a little later, then God said, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness. So right here in the beginning, we see God creating through the power of his word and the spirit of God on the move. And already we start to see that mysterious plurality. The verbs and pronouns in these verses are singular. He created, he said. So there's the unity. We don't have multiple gods. And yet when God speaks of creating mankind, he says, let us make mankind in our image, according to our likeness. And even the standard Hebrew word for God, Elohim, is grammatically plural. Moving on then to the book of Proverbs, a compilation of ancient wisdom literature, which talks about a personified figure of wisdom with a capital W, who has been with God from the beginning and through whom God created the universe. Ages ago, I was set up at the first before the beginning of the earth. When he marked out the foundations of the earth, there was I beside him like a master worker. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing before him always. Whoever finds me finds life and obtains favour from the Lord. Moving on further to the book of Daniel, this prophet takes the theme even further with the vision of a human figure, the son of man, who is brought before God's throne and given an everlasting kingdom. I saw one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient One and was presented before him. To him was given dominion and glory and kingship, that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that shall not pass away, and his kingship is one that shall never be destroyed. And this is the vision that Jesus is referring to in the New Testament, when he calls himself the son of man. So in these cases, we see mysterious figures, the wisdom of God, the son of man, who seem to be described with the attributes of God, and yet are also distinct in some way from the primary person of God, the ancient one. And this idea is sometimes known as the two powers in heaven theology, although at this point it's still very vague and undefined. So the Old Testament isn't really the best starting point for understanding the Trinity, because it's only in hindsight that these hints start to fit together in light of Jesus and with the help of the Holy Spirit to guide the church into all truth. But I tried to show briefly that the Old Testament raises enough questions by itself to challenge a simple Unitarian view of God's nature. One of the difficulties in defending the doctrine of the Trinity is that it gets challenged from all sorts of different angles. As we said earlier, there are really at least six different premises in question, and the conversation can go very differently depending on whether you're talking to a Muslim, a Jew, a Jehovah's Witness, or anything else. So it's important to first understand where the person we're talking to is coming from. But for many of us, the most common direction of attack is from atheists who deny the existence of God altogether. And in this case, we would have to take a different approach. There's no point trying to argue from the Bible if the person we're talking to doesn't accept the Bible as authoritative. 
probably the most standard atheist objection to the Trinity is simply that it doesn't make sense. How can God be three and also one? How can a reasonable person be expected to believe what sounds like complete nonsense? Believing in God is one thing, but this just seems too far. But then in one sense, this is easily answered. There's so much that we don't understand about the world we live in. How many of us can make sense of quantum physics? We exist in a much bigger and more complicated universe than we could ever hope to understand on our own. And so why should we even expect to understand the nature of God? In his book, Mere Christianity, C.S. Lewis uses the helpful analogy of a cube. If we lived in a two-dimensional world, then the concept of a cube would seem ridiculous. This thing is made up of six squares, and yet it remains a single shape. Well, which is it? Is it six things or one thing? And of course, from our three-dimensional vantage point, we can easily perceive the reality of six shapes that together make one shape. And at this point in time, we're used to the idea that the universe consists of multiple dimensions beyond our experience. And modern mathematicians happily talk about things like four-dimensional shapes, like this one. So the fact that the Trinity goes beyond our human perception isn't really a very convincing argument by itself. Ultimately, I think the Trinity is just the sort of complex picture of God we would expect in a universe as complex as ours. Now, of course, you could say that's avoiding the question, but sometimes we do need to reassess our attitudes and expectations. I think in this case, what appears at first sight to be a rational objection just turns out to be an emotional one. The Trinity is not really being rejected because it's incoherent or illogical, but because it's strange, because it reaches beyond our ordinary human comprehension. And so it challenges our pride, our desire to understand God in our own terms, to put him in a box. I'd like to end on a more practical note. You might ask, what does all this complex doctrine have to do with us? Why does the Trinity matter? Well, I started out by grounding the topic in the teaching of Jesus as he sends his church out into the world with a mission for the nations. And as Christians, we are all baptised in the name of the triune, the three-in-one God. And the Trinity, I think, is important because it reminds us that the God we worship is not faceless or remote, but is made known to us in human form and accessible by his spirit. Christian faith isn't just about submission to a harsh divine will imposed from above, but a dynamic relationship with a living God whose very essence is love and fellowship. And let's think about that biblical statement that God is love. If God was alone before he invented intelligent life, then this doesn't really seem to make sense. Who was there to love? How can love exist without an object of love? But if there is in fact relationship, even within the eternal oneness of God, if God is three as well as one, then that means the love between the members of the Trinity is something that's intrinsic to the very nature of God. And finally, the Trinity is not just some abstract intellectual doctrine, but it's at the heart of our Christian experience, because as Christians, we're given mysterious access to that divine fellowship. Paul says in his letter to the Romans, that all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. So whenever we pray to God as Father, it is God the Holy Spirit who prays with us. God before us, God beside us, and God within us. When we were baptised, we were adopted as children of God the Father. We became members of the body of Christ, and we have been given the gift of the Holy Spirit to guide and transform us from within.